So um, I don't normally uh, preach on Sunday mornings, so for those of you who don't know, my name is Matt. I've been a member here for a little over um, 10 years now, and actually it was uh, 12 years ago this June, this month, that I moved to this area after graduating from college, um, got a job with an engineering firm in downtown Baltimore. And as most of you know, um, American secular universities are not exactly the most supportive places for biblical Christianity, right? Um, So you you learn things in college science classes that come with the presumption that it's not really rational to believe in God anymore in this day and age. And so when I graduated, you know, an engineering degree doesn't require a whole lot of science classes, but there's enough in there that I realized that when I graduated, I kind of had this hurdle that needed to be faced because I wanted to take my Christian faith seriously but I needed to, to ask how to square that with modern science because the belief in God is foundational to the Christian worldview. And around the time that I moved here, the church had recently hired a Bible college professor named Chuck McCoy. A lot of you guys will remember him. He taught a lot of classes here and, and ministered here. And he took time to talk to me about these questions and he pointed me to different uh, references and resources that really helped me understand that Christianity does not contradict the actual evidence that's out there in the world. And I found this to be confirmed the more and more that I read the arguments from Christian scientists and scholars. However, um, I didn't want this to just be confirmation bias. So I also looked into what the non-Christians had to say. I wanted both sides of the argument. And I can remember relatively early on starting to read Richard Dawkins' best-selling book, The God Delusion. And I remember when I started reading it, I got kind of this knot in my stomach. I almost felt a little sick because I realized that if I came to the conclusion that Christianity wasn't true, I wasn't going to be a Christian. I'm not going to believe something that's false. As C.S. Lewis says, if Christianity is untrue, then no honest man wants to believe it, however helpful or comforting it might be. And that's the same idea that we find in Scripture. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, he's talking about Jesus' resurrection, and he says if Jesus did not actually rise from the dead, he says we Christians are of all men most to be pitied because we're believing a lie. Christianity is true or it's nothing. And Peter says we do not follow cleverly devised tales. Now, um, as is probably obvious given the fact that I'm speaking this morning, um, within the first few pages of Dawkins' book, I realized uh, that not only did he not have any actual good arguments against Christianity, but he didn't even really know what Christians believed in the first place. He kind of set up a version of Christianity that was fit for a five-year-old and then took pleasure in just attacking it. Um, It was actually kind of pathetic. And so what I found was my faith was strengthened because I realized that, you know, the most popular atheist book on the market can do nothing to the basic foundations that we have. Uh, and that we believe as Christians. It reminds me of a poem written by a man named John Clifford about a hundred years ago. It's called The Anvil of God's Word. So let's read that. Last eve I passed beside a blacksmith's door and heard the anvil ring the vesper chime. Then looking in, I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with the beating years of time. How many anvils have you had, said I, to wear and batter all these hammers so? Just one, said he, with twinkling eye. The anvil wears the hammers out, you know. And so thought I, the anvil of God's word, for ages skeptics' blows have beat upon. Yet, though the noise of falling blows was heard, the anvil is unharmed, the hammers gone. See, God's word and his truth, it really does stand the test of time. And it's so encouraging to see that. So last week, 
Rick talked about truth, right? He talked about the discoverability of truth, and he also talked about the ultimate embodiment of truth in the person of Jesus Christ. So now this morning, what I'm going to talk about and what I've already kind of mentioned uh, is pointing to facts and evidence to support the religious truth of what we believe. But is this approach biblical? Right? So the opening video talked about how important it is for us to use God's word as our guide and our standard. So let's see what God's word says on the topic of appealing to evidence in the natural world to show uh, the truth of Christianity and, and, and the fact of God's existence. So the Apostle Paul specifically appeals to this fact in the book of Romans. So in Romans, um, there's actually a pretty large section on this in Romans chapter 1, but I just want to look at one verse. So Paul talks about how God has made himself evident to all men. He says in Romans 1 verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood by what has been made so that they, that is non-Christians, unbelievers, are without excuse. And and one of my favorite psalms teaches the same thing. Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2. It says, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. So using poetic language there, the psalmist says that the heavens proclaim the glory of God. It's as if they're speaking to us about God. He has left his fingerprints on his creation for us to see. So why shouldn't we look into it and proclaim God's glory through creation, right? And also throughout the book of Acts, uh, the apostles' sermons, they appeal to Jesus' resurrection as evidence to support the truth of who he claimed to be and what his mission was. So just one example, in Acts 17.31, Paul says that God has furnished proof to all men by raising him, that is Jesus, from the dead. The apostles appeal to the resurrection and the facts of the resurrection, the eyewitnesses, the empty tomb, and uh, the appearances of Christ after his resurrection as evidence for the truth of Christianity. That, That carries through into the epistles as well. And then the last verse to look at um, for this topic in 1 Peter 3.15, the Apostle Peter tells us to always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. And that word defense, a lot of you are familiar with this, it comes from the Greek word apologia, which, which means defense. It's not an apology. Apologetics is a defense of the faith. It's not apologizing for being a Christian. So this is a very biblical endeavor. Talking about evidence is not against faith. It's actually part of our faith, and it's part of how we grow and mature as Christians. So this morning, I want to share with you an argument that supports the existence of God. And this argument, um, it's important to point out, it doesn't bring you to the full truth of Christianity, but it bridges an important issue that a lot of people may have concerns about that you talk to out in the world. And that is that a God like the Christian, an entity like the Christian God must exist. That's a very important step. Um, And maybe just a little disclaimer. So there's a lot of information here. Um, And and in fact, all of apologetics and even all of theology, there's a lot of information. The Bible's a long book, right, in general. And so don't feel like you have to memorize and remember everything. Um, I think it's good for us to hear these things so that we know that the actual evidence supports what we believe, even if not every Christian is able to recite and repeat all of these evidences and facts. Um, Here's an illustration of what I mean by that. So an atheist asked his Christian friend if he remembered the sermon that he heard last month. And the Christian said he didn't remember. So his atheist friend said, well, then what's the point of hearing a sermon each week if you don't remember what it's about? So his Christian friend thought for a minute and asked asked his friend if he remembered what he had for dinner last Tuesday night. Well, his friend couldn't exactly remember what he had, so the Christian said, well, then why did you eat dinner if you don't remember what you had? And it's not a perfect analogy, but the point is that even though you don't remember exactly what you had for dinner every night, the food nourishes you, right? It contributes to you being alive and healthy today. 
And likewise, the Christian spirit is nourished not only by Sunday morning sermons, but also by Bible study, Bible reading, prayer, even if you don't remember um, every single word. So don't be discouraged. Jesus says man is, does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And his nature, um, and what God shows us through nature, is part of his word. That's what Psalm 19 was just saying to us. Okay, so with that being said, let's get into the argument. It's, it's called the cosmological argument. Um, now, there's one of the other things you'll find if you, if you start looking into apologetics is that there's a, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of even different types of single arguments. So there's a number of cosmological arguments. But in general, the family, that family of arguments are all based on the fact that the universe must have an ultimate transcendent cause or explanation for its existence. Now, now, some atheists say that the universe doesn't need an explanation, right? It just exists. That's it. it it's, it's, a, it's, it's the brute fact that, that we begin with, is that the universe exists. Now, apart from being extremely unscientific, that's also not very rational. Um, so let me, let me show you what I mean by that. So think of it this way. Imagine that you're hiking through an unexplored portion of the Amazon rainforest. And you come across a small, shiny ball, and you ask your companion, I wonder what the explanation is for that. And he says to you, it doesn't have an explanation, it's just there. Right? That's, that's not a rational response. Now, imagine if that shiny ball were the size of this auditorium. It still needs an explanation, right? What if it were the size of the state of Texas? It still needs an explanation, what if it were the size of the whole earth? What if that shiny little ball were the entire expanding universe? Right? Size doesn't matter. It still requires an explanation. So, of course, we are justified in asking for an explanation for the existence of the universe. And that illustration that I just gave about explanations is more related to the Leibnizian cosmological argument. But this morning, we're going to specifically look at the Kalam cosmological argument. It was made uh, famous by Christian philosopher Dr. William Lane Craig, and it has two premises, a conclusion, and then we're going to draw out the implications of that conclusion. So that might, sound, that might have sounded complicated, but just wait till you see how simple this is. So here's the formal argument. I think it's up on the screen. Think about each of these lines as we say them. Premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Premise two, the universe began to exist. Premise, or conclusion, therefore the universe has a cause. So let's let's leave this slide up for the next few minutes and we're going to talk through some of these. So, so that's it, though. That's it. That's the argument. Now, all you have to do is remember that outline, those three, those three lines, and some basic defenses of, of the premises, and you have the basics for a very powerful apologetics argument, and I'll show you how that works. And, and if you ask me, the real power of this argument, it comes in the implications of the conclusion. Okay, so think about it this way. The universe is defined as all of space, time, energy, and matter. Space, time, energy, and matter. So if that began to exist at a certain point in time, then the cause for that must have been spaceless, timeless, immaterial, and unimaginably powerful, and also causal. Do you you see? Why? That's why atheists have gone to unimaginably radical lengths to try to get out of that conclusion. And although we haven't arrived, as I said before, I'll say this again, although we have not arrived at full-fledged Christianity through this argument, this argument bridges a huge gap that people have, and it completely abolishes any rationality for the atheistic worldview. The conclusion is very profound. And yet the argument is unbelievably simple, right? So with that being said, we need to defend these premises, okay? So we're going to start with premise one. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. 
Okay, now that, that seems completely undeniable on its face, right? And, and actually, it is undeniable by anybody who is an honest seeker of truth. If things could just pop into existence with no cause whatsoever, then why don't we see that happening all the time? Why doesn't a hungry tiger just appear on the stage and eat me right now? Why doesn't an anvil appear in midair and fall on Chuck Flitter's head? There's no reason for that not to happen. Why doesn't Beethoven just appear and start playing his piano on top of Mount Everest? No, things do not pop into existence uncaused. If the price, think about this, if the price of avoiding the conclusion means that you have to deny premise one, then atheism is intellectually bankrupt. Okay? And now we're going to do a real short uh, digression here. So sometimes you'll find atheists responding to this argument by saying, okay, fine, so everything has a cause, and you say God caused the universe, well then, and you'll get like a smug smile, what caused God? Right? Now, sadly, this argument misses the entire point. Look at premise one. It does not say everything has a cause. It explicitly does not say everything has a cause. It says whatever begins to exist has a cause. Christians have reasons to believe that God exists necessarily and uncaused. And if that's true, he does not have a cause. We never said that everything needs a cause. That's not a philosophical statement that Christians make or even really atheists make. This is not special pleading by Christians for the, case, for the existence of God. And that issue can be debated separately, but it's not relevant to this premise or to this argument. And either way, as we'll see, the bottom line is that no matter what, there must be some uncaused cause. There must be an unmoved mover. There has to be something without a cause. We're just saying the universe isn't it. And then we're drawing implications from that. Um, it, it's also worth pointing out, the question, what caused God? It's a really silly question, and you will not find respectable atheists using that. Using that. Like atheist scholars and philosophers, they don't, they don't say that. Of course, it's in Richard Dawkins' book, but it's not used by serious thinkers uh, in debates with the, the top Christian scholars. And there's, um, I just recently saw a video uh, where uh, there's a, an atheist philosopher named Dr. Michael Roos, and he's very... Um, scholarly and respectable, and he says flat out that he is really embarrassed by the use of that argument by popular figures such as Richard Dawkins. Um, so that was a quick digression, but that was premise one, okay? Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Now let's move on to the second premise. We're going to spend a little bit more time here. The second premise, premise two, the universe began to exist, we're going to look at that from two perspectives, philosophical and scientific. So first, very briefly, from the philosophical perspective. Okay, so for hundreds of years, thousands of years, even when scientists thought that the universe was eternal, scientists only realized about 100 years ago that the universe had to have a starting point. So even when scientists thought that the universe was eternal, uh, theologians and philosophers knew that it had to have a starting point. They knew that. They, an actual infinite series of past events, it cannot exist. It's not possible. And, and it, it's, it's pretty, I don't know what word to use, it's pretty mind-bending to get into the details of why that can't happen. Um, so we're not going to do that right now. But the point is that even ancient and medieval philosophers had figured out that the universe must have had a starting point, And they had no access to modern science. It's, it's pretty, pretty incredible. If you're interested in this, you know, look up. There's a, a really um, well-known example um, called Hilbert's Hotel. So just look that up if you're interested more in, in why infinite series and infinite um, actualities can't exist in reality. Okay, so with that, let's look at this now from a scientific perspective. Okay, so as we said, as I just said a minute ago, it's, it's only been about 100 years since scientists have discovered the fact that the universe has a starting point. Um, in 1978, the NASA physicist and founding director of the Goddard Space Flight Center, right down there in Greenbelt, Maryland, um, Robert Jastrow, talked about how scientists felt 
when they realize that the universe must have had a starting point. He says, for the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak. He pulls himself over the final rock, and he's greeted by a little band of theologians who've been sitting there for centuries. And and I think that that's an accurate illustration of how atheistic scientists must have felt when they were forced to accept that the universe is not eternal. They must have felt that they had to give in to the last group of people that they ever wanted to give in to, right? The, The religious nuts, the Christians who believe in God. But it's, it's, it's a solid fact. The, the prevailing cosmological uh, model has a beginning, an absolute starting point. The universe definitely began to exist at a very specific point of time before which there was nothing, not anything. And this, this is important, okay? So regardless of that, regardless of the conclusion of the prevailing cosmological model, even if that's not correct, modern physics has proven, proven that any model of the universe that is scientifically viable must have an absolute beginning. So you'll notice that I haven't been using the word proof up here very much. We're talking about evidence. So when when, when people say proof, it's important to to pay attention because that means something different. Um, so, so the fact that the, the universe must have a starting point, it was proven by three leading non-Christian physicists, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin. And here's a quote by non-Christian cosmologist Alexander Vilenkin about this proof. He said, It is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men, and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. That's powerful right there. Now, even with that proof in place, there's still more evidence. So we're going to look at one more example. And we could... I could do this for hours. We're going to look at one more example. This is the second law of thermodynamics. So the second law of thermodynamics says that processes taking place in a closed system always tend towards a state of equilibrium. Now, in other words, um, what that's, all that's saying is that a closed system of, of energy and, and activity will eventually consume all the usable energy as time goes on. Right? Like a car engine, you fill the gas tank with gas, it runs out of gas, right? So, so think about that. Think about a car driving along the road. It's using gasoline as it drives, right? The gas tank can only hold a limited amount of fuel. So if you see the car driving still, then you know it hasn't been driving forever or for, t- for too long, right? Otherwise, it would have run out of gas. That's it. In a nutshell, that's it. So, so now we look at the universe, if the universe, and the universe is the epitome of a closed system, right? It's, it's a closed system of matter and energy. If the, if the universe were past eternal, so if it were driving forever, then all of the usable energy would have been completely used up by now. You see? There would be no sun. There would be no stars, no light, no heat, no life. Nothing but cold, a cold, dead lifeless soup of atoms separated by unimaginably vast distances and growing vaster. Just a dark sea of nothingness. That is the end on the atheistic model, on on the atheistic worldview. And that's what science shows is happening. And we don't live in that type of a universe right now. Do you see? So it can't possibly have been going on forever. That's, that's a law. The, the, the second law of thermodynamics is not a theory. It's not a hypothesis. It's a law. So think about what that means for our purposes. It is an absolutely indisputable fact that the universe has a beginning unless someone is willing to deny that the second law, unless someone's willing to deny the second law of thermodynamics and the proof 
of the bohr guth vilenkin theorem that we mentioned earlier. Okay, so think about the statement that we made at the end of premise one. Based on what we just said about the scientific evidence for the beginning of the universe, if the price of avoiding the cosmological argument's conclusion means that you have to deny premise two, then atheism is scientifically bankrupt. You see that? Okay, so let's run through the three lines of the cosmological argument one more time and see if you can feel the weight of what each of these lines means now that we've kind of talked through the premises a little bit. Premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Premise two, the universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. And remember, the implications of that conclusion. You can pull up the next slide. Because the universe is all of time, space, matter, and energy, there must be a timeless, spaceless, immaterial, an immensely powerful entity that caused the universe to come into existence. And since it caused the universe to come into existence, it must be causal itself. Now, now think about this. If nature, the natural world, is all of time, space, energy, and matter, and the cause is outside of that, it is by definition supernatural. By definition. It, it has to be. There, there's no way around this for the atheists. There's just no way around it. They're, they're literally painted into a corner here. The two premises are true, and therefore the conclusion logically must be true. So therefore, this entity must exist. There's, there's, there's no escape, as Valenkin said. There's absolutely no escape. So... We as Christians are really the ones who are living more consistently with the facts than our atheist friends, right? Despite what the modern secular world wants you to believe, we're the ones living rationally with the evidence. So, so let's see. Is, let's kind of confirm that. So, so is the scientific and logical conclusion of the cosmological argument consistent with the Bible? Well, amazingly, and I don't think we appreciate this fully, amazingly, without modern science, the Bible clearly teaches that God, right, a transcendent entity, like what we just described, created the physical universe at a distinct point in the past. It says this right on the first page in the first sentence of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's astounding that that's the first line of the Bible, given what we have shown to be true in modern science. In the New Testament, John begins his gospel with a reference to the creation event. And he uses redundant language to really bring home the fact that God created every single thing that exists. So look at John 1.3. He says, All things came into being through him. And then he reiterates, apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So since the very beginning, think about this, since the very beginning, even Jewish doctrine and Christian doctrine has always maintained the same point that we confirm by modern cosmology, that everything came into existence through a transcendent cause. And it's unique among ancient religions. I mean, obviously, Islam gets it because Muhammad was influenced by Christianity and Judaism. But other ancient religions, they do not teach this. They begin with something, some primordial soup of matter or energy or chaos or something. This is, this is unique. I love the poetic language that the Psalms use to describe creation as well. It, it gives a little bit of a different imagery. So let's look at a couple of those. Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made... And by the breath of his mouth, all their host. And, and I think this is, this is 
pretty powerful as well. The Bible even makes it clear that God, this transcendent entity that brought the universe into existence, existed prior to the creation of the natural world. Look at Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And and this type of creation language, it fills, fills the Old and New Testaments. Um, But again, I think this is now the the third time I really want to emphasize this. The cosmological argument in and of itself, it does not get us all the way to the full-blown Christian uh, conception of God. So so remember, and you might have to point this out to to your atheist friends or co-workers or family members. They say, you give them the cosmological argument, and they're like, well, fine, but that's still not Jesus rising from the dead. You know, apologetics arguments are cumulative. So you establish one point. It's like building a brick wall. Once you put one brick on the ground, somebody says, that's not a wall. You're like, well, I know. I didn't say it was a finished wall. That's the first brick, right? So this is a brick in the wall. Cosmological arguments, uh, I'm sorry, apologetics arguments are cumulative. You build your case. So the cosmological argument establishes certain facts. You can move on to another argument to establish other facts. And they build on one another. And sometimes other arguments will refer back to that. And ultimately, the atheists are, again, they're painted into a corner. The non-Christians are painted into a corner. You cannot deny um, the, the premises in these arguments and still be an honest, rational, rational person. I just think a lot of people haven't looked into it. That, that might be why so many don't accept the conclusions of these arguments. So with that being said, let's look back again. The conclusion of the cosmological argument, the implications are that there's a timeless, spaceless, immaterial, incredibly powerful, and causal entity that brought the universe into existence. And like I said, that's a lot further than any atheist wants to go. Um, So, you know, I talked about how apologetics arguments are cumulative. Let me just mention another group of powerful apologetics arguments. We're not going to get into them this morning, but um, these are also related to modern science, and they are uh, called teleological arguments, and all that really means is design arguments, arguments from design. Um, One of the most powerful to me is the argument from the fine-tuning of the universe. So the the universe has been fine-tuned for stability in life, and um, the conclusions of that argument, it uses the same airtight logic as the cosmological argument, and the conclusion is that it's more rational to believe that there's an intelligent designer of the universe than that it just came about by chance. And so, like I said, we don't have time to get into this one this morning, um, but if you're looking for more information on the cosmological arguments, fine-tuning, or any other apologetics, I would recommend the ministry of uh, Dr. William Lane Craig, who I mentioned earlier. So his introductory book is called On Guard. Um, I know some, some of us in the church here recently read this book. Uh, they have a website, www.reasonablefaith.org. It's got short animated videos for the various arguments um, that are like six minutes long. It's also got two and a half hour debates where he goes up with the leading atheist cosmologists and, and ph- philosophers, and you can see Christianity the, and the truth, truths of Christianity debated at the very top level. Um, so in closing, if, if we combine the implications of the conclusion from the cosmological argument and the teleological argument, think about what we've been able to confirm. So through evidence you can confirm that there is a timeless, spaceless, immaterial, unimaginably powerful, intelligent, designing entity that brought the universe into existence. Isn't that pretty much what the Christian conception of God is? And and you'll notice that we've kind of left out the moral component, right? God is all of those things, but he is also morally perfect and good. But that's what the moral arguments bring out. There's apologetics arguments that are moral arguments in nature. And they show that that, they show that aspect of God. So once we've established that entity existing, then we go and we talk about the evidence for Jesus' resurrection. And we use that as background. So we know that that entity exists. And then we look at the empty tomb and the post-mortem appearances of Jesus and the evidence for, or in the, um, the ex- explanation for the beginning of the Christian church and all these other things that contribute to the evidence for Jesus' resurrection with the background knowledge that this 
godlike entity must exist, absolutely must exist. And what you find is that it is overwhelmingly more reasonable to be a Christian than to be a non-Christian. That's why Frank Turek and um, Norman Geisler named their book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. It takes way more faith to be an atheist. You have to deny one of these two premises. That's, that's crazy. Think about this sentence. Christianity is objectively, actually, really true. Period. Do you see how awesome it is to look into the evidence for the existence of God and the truth of Christianity? We Christians are not the ones turning away from the conclusions of modern science. Rather, and the irony is almost unbearable, those who try to use science to appeal to their atheistic worldview are the ones who are being irrational. So with that, let's, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you so much for your revelation in nature as well. Lord, I am just so thankful that we live in a time where we have access to these conclusions and where we can really see uh, your glory shown in creation and how amazing it is that you brought all of this to be from, from nothing, ex nihilo. You brought it out of nothing, and you are just so amazing uh, for doing that and for putting your fingerprints in the heavens for anyone who's willing to look. And, and Lord, I know that so many turn away because of their will um, and not because of their intellectual inability to accept your existence. So I just pray for the hearts of people who um, are turned away from you, that you would soften them and help them to see uh, what you've written to them, both in the pages of your revealed word and also uh, in the pages of creation. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for the uh, time that we had to, to spend talking about that and looking into that this morning. Uh, we love you uh, so much, Lord, and we thank you so much for Jesus who, who really came to earth and really rose from the dead after he died for our sins. And it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Have you ever seen the one?